Our next guest does not require any introduction. Doug Casey, welcome back. I'm very excited to have you on today's call, um, and I'm looking forward to your insights of what we can expect in 2024. Okay, Michael, it's nice to be here with you, and I will um, polish up my crystal ball. <laughs> well, we can take this in any direction you like. I mean, I want to open things up, and maybe we'll just kind of talk. Let's talk from maybe the geopolitical side of things first, because it looks like the war, the world is kind of heading to World War III if we're not already firmly in World War III. What do you think is is going to happen? Are we going to get back to normal? Are, are people going to uh, shake hands and make up? Or do you think we're going to see this continue with China, with Ukraine, with Iran, with Turkey, with all of these places? Uh, I'd say the chances of a return to the, uh, perhaps we can say the pre-COVID hysteria normal. I mean, if we want to use that as a, a base case, I'd say it's close to zero. Uh, uh, one reason is that there are a lot of people that are in positions of power that have been talking about the need for a great reset, they call it. And they've been talking about this for years. And I think they're finally going to get it. Uh, so what's it going to look like and and, and what's going to happen? Um, and of course, this, this kind of fits in with the uh, Strauss and Howe theory of generations and the fourth turning, which I think makes a lot of sense. They've actually been right so far, and other cyclical views of history. So what's going to happen next? Uh, this is almost anything that we say today could be totally turned on its head tomorrow or next week or next month. Uh, so I I hesitate, hesitate to make any predictions, except that the overall situation is, let's look at the economic part of it to start with. Uh, we've been living in a Keynesian fantasy for decades. Uh, we've been approaching the climax of it uh, since about the year 2000, where large bubbles were blown and governments responded with printing up hundreds of billions and now trillions and multi-trillions of dollars to keep the ball rolling. Uh, I think we've embarked upon something that for years I've called the Greater Depression. I call it the Greater Depression because it's going to be much worse and much longer lasting and much different than the unpleasantness of 1929 to 1946. Uh, and I make this prediction because when governments, well, there are many things that governments do to create distortions and misallocations of capital in the markets, but perhaps the most important thing is the debasement of the currency, which does all kinds of things uh, that have to be rectified later. So chances of a financial collapse uh, are excellent. Maybe it'll take the form of a, a deflationary collapse. Maybe it'll take the form of uh, something resembling a hyperinflation. Uh, that could lead into an economic collapse, failure of many banks, major corporations, large-scale unemployment. Uh, and of course, governments will make that worse too, because uh, they'll put on foreign exchange controls, maybe travel controls. We've heard about 15 minute cities, which are being implemented in a number of places around the world, as a matter of fact. Uh, the military situation, which started in Ukraine, could easily spin out of control. I don't think they're going to. Uh, arrive at a, a happy gumbaya moment. And I blame the U.S. government for being in back of this and having uh, having made it as bad as it is. And I think it's going to get worse. Uh, we can talk about the social situation where, uh, 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 which relates to the economic situation when the economy gets bad, inflation gets bad, 
a lot of people get out in the streets and start burning and looting. What happened in the U.S. a couple of years ago with the BLM thing, the Antifa thing, could easily happen again. So um, take your choice. But I'm pretty gloomy, uh, pretty gloomy. Well, a couple of months ago, we aired episode 250 of my program, and I was going back and I was doing a, a mashup of some of the guests that have been on the show. And I found our episode from probably about six years ago when I the first, first, first time I interviewed you. And actually, a lot of your predictions from six years ago are playing out in lockstep right now today. I mean, so you've been really bang on. And I know it's always difficult to make predictions on these types of things, but your track record on this is eerily accurate on, on a lot of it. It's, it's, it's quite difficult to kind of watch and um, that these things are actually coming true, you know? Well, I think what we're looking at is a collapsing empire. Even though the U.S., is only 4% of the world's population, really small number. Uh, it, it bestrides the world like a giant. And it's uh, the US is a de facto empire. Uh, by exporting the dollar, uh, which has been the major export of the US for the last 40 years, it hasn't been Boeing's or or soybeans, or IBMs. We ship hundreds of billions of dollars abroad every year, and nice foreigners send us stuff in exchange for those dollars, and those dollars are like a time bomb sitting outside the U.S. Uh, Americans have to use them in the U.S. by law. Foreigners don't have to use them, but it's been very convenient for them to use it. Uh, one prediction that I'll make, I think I'll be right, is with the rise of the BRICS, <clears throat> uh, basically equatorial and southern hemisphere countries, India, China, the, uh, Iran, uh, non-Western countries is what I mean to say. Uh, they don't want to use the dollar anymore because it's a hot potato being inflated out of existence with the trillions of them being created. Uh, they don't want to use U.S. banks because I think most of them are factually bankrupt. Uh, what happened with uh, those three banks, Republic and SVP, uh, I think that was just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and, of course, all international dollar uh, trades clear in New York. They don't trust the U.S. government because of what the the fools in Washington did to the Russians, basically stealing uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of their money. And everybody's asking, well, I could be next. And the fact that the U.S. government is bold enough to have put sanctions on, I think, the number of countries that are currently sanctioned for one thing or another is over 30. It's not just the Russians uh, and the Iranians and the Cubans, 30 other countries. And they've really just about had it. I mean, they can see that the, the giant is about to, to topple, so they're going to set up their own monetary system. So the prediction, here's the prediction I'll make. It's that uh, these BRIC countries won't come up with their own currency because none of their currencies are any good either. They're all fiat currencies that are most of them unacceptable outside of the borders of their countries. Nobody takes an... Uh, uh, Indian rupee outside of India. Nobody takes a ruble outside of Russia. So what are they going to come up with? Well, they're going to come up with using gold again in some form for settlements. And hopefully that'll come down to a retail level um, using the internet, uh, using your, your iPhone to transfer gold. I think that's what's going to happen. They're going to go to gold, and then the dollar is really going to go into free fall. So that's that's one thing that I'm really comfortable with saying that's going to happen over the next decade. 
Well, it's interesting with the de-dollarization and understanding a new world reserve currency. I think that what a lot of people seem to think is that if U.S. loses the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency, then we're all going to move over to something else. I don't think that's going to happen. I think we're going to have several and there's going to be different trading blocks. And I think we're going to see more of a polarization. Um, I would love to see gold do exactly what you're saying it's going to do. Do you think that there is a chance it actually might be something like a commodity backed currency, you know, things that the different countries have different weightings based on their natural resources and how this works. Because when I look at the BRICS countries, really, that's what it is. These are massively resource rich countries. Um, Russia, Brazil, I'm super bullish on Brazil in general. I don't like what's happening with Brazilian government right now. But Brazil, as a resource-rich country, I think there's a lot to be said for this. Have you spent any time thinking about what might look like as an alternative to gold, but still backed by something that they can't just turn on the printing press for? Yeah, I, I don't think that anything except, frankly, gold can be used. You can't use... Look, the reason, the reason I say it'll come down to gold and not a basket of commodities is for the same reason that gold has always been used as money. Uh, Aristotle laid out five principles of a sound money. It has to be durable. So you can't use wheat as money. I mean, the Russians might like that, that the world's largest wheat exporter, but it's not durable. You can't save wheat more than a year or two. It's gotta be divisible. That's why you can't use artwork as money. Uh, it's got to be convenient. That's why you can't use lead as money. Uh, it, it takes too much of it, or oil as money, for that matter. It, it's got to be consistent. Uh, that's why you can't use. Uh, that's why you can't use real estate as money. Every piece is different than other. I mean, the French tried that after the revolution with the assignats, where they were. Uh, said that the assignat was backed by the land that they confiscated from the church. And so that doesn't work. And it's got to have utility value in and of itself, which is why you can't use paper or digits as, as money. Uh, so those are the five reasons that, that Aristotle uh, pointed out why gold was money. It's the only thing that we have that fits all of those characteristics. And there is a sixth reason. It can't be created out of midair, out of thin air. That wouldn't, that didn't occur to Aristotle. It wasn't a possible to think about such a thing in those days, but that's the sixth reason. Uh, no, uh, I, I, I don't, it's, it's gotta be backed with something that's fungible, that can be transferred, subtle debts. And you can't, if one guy's got wheat and the other guy's got oil, you, that's why we have money, so you don't have to barter. No, so no, it, it'll be gold. Okay. What about the CBDCs, the central bank digital currencies? Do you think that they're going to play a part in a new reserve currency, or do you think that because those are central banks of individual countries, that the other countries not going to want anything to do with that? That doesn't eliminate the the trust factor. Where really, gold is the only one that's going to eliminate um, the needing of trust. No, these CBDCs are a, a total and absolute catastrophe, a disaster. Uh, the thing that I value most, I mean, it, it, you've got a lot of things that we all value, but I put personal freedom right at the very top of the list. And in order to have personal freedom, you've got to have money. Money lets you go and do and have what you want. So... <laughs> These C CBDCs mean that, that money would be strictly digital. It would clear through a central bank, and it would all be on your iPhone. Huge problem. It means that the amount of Fed dollars, if you want to call that, uh, these digital things on your iPhone, the CBDCs you have, you could be debited or credited, as depending on whether you're naughty or nice. Uh, no, they're they're a catastrophe, and I hope people don't use them uh, and avoid them uh, wherever possible. Uh, but you know, you've got even the IMF has its own potential CBDC with the um, special drawing right. 
which is kind of a melange of currencies that they put together. So I think it's going to be a failure, but uh, they're going to try to impose those things on everybody. It's, it's not good. Well, we have a, a friend in common, um, Paul Rosenberg, who has wrote extensively on encouraging everybody in his network that if they're an IT specialist or programmer or interested in the blockchain, not to be participating at any level in these CBDCs. Don't be participating in the development of it. Don't be supporting it. You know, at, at any level, oppose it um, on all fronts. And I think that he's 100% correct. I think that these things are, are pure evil and we should not be uh, pretending otherwise. It's just very oh, interesting. Oh. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting to think about how other countries are going to handle these things because I look at it and go, all right, well, if everything was the US dollar reserve currency, and now we watch what happened with Russia, we talk about, we look at all these sanctions that have happened around the world. I think that people are going to naturally, other governments are going to be naturally very skeptical of taking anything that they can't control. So even if China comes out with a CBDC and India comes out with the CBDC, India is not going to be taking China's CBDC. I don't think that they want anything to do with that. So no, it, they don't they, they don't trust each other. And why should they trust each other? That's why they basically have been using the dollar so far. But now they manifestly don't want to use the dollars anymore. It, I think it'll come back to, to gold, Michael. I, I really I really do. Have you seen or have you been following the countries who have been buying up gold over the last five, 10 years? Um, it's very interesting to watch the central banks that are actually buying gold, uh, places that maybe I wouldn't have expected Yeah, 10 years ago now are buying hand over fist as much gold as they can possibly get. Like China and Russia are two of them, I guess. And Turkey and some of the other countries in um, even Poland and some of these countries are buying up gold at alarming rates. So I think that there's something to watch there. And the idiots that run the Western world have sold all their gold. The, <clears throat> the uh, Canadians and the uh, Brits are, have sold all their gold and they basically bottom tick the market uh, on, on, on top of it. So, uh, yeah, you're right. And, and as far as the price of gold, um, okay, gold's been bouncing around $1,800 $1, to $2,000 in that area. My feeling for some time has been it's reasonably priced. Gold was at giveaway levels back in 1971 when it was, the dollar was devalued the first time. And it was at giveaway levels in 2001 when it hit $250 an ounce, when in real terms, deflated dollars, gold was as cheap as it was at $35 back in 1971, a long time ago. Um, well, right now, at, at these prices, gold impresses me as reasonable relative to the prices of everything from a, buying a meal to getting close to buying a house or whatever. I think it's going higher though. It, it has to go higher because one thing that people don't think about too much is that <clears throat> since the dawn of history, uh, we don't know, but people have guesstimated based upon that there's in between six and seven billion ounces of gold above ground in the world. It's really not that much. Well, there's tw what is it, 23 billion Bitcoins uh, or 23 million Bitcoins, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, tw 21 million, I think, is the, yeah. But then we actually have no idea how many because so many of them have been lost and someone threw out a laptop in a landfill that had thousands upon it and stuff like that, but yeah. Yeah, we really don't know how many actually exist. Uh, and I guess it's true for gold to a good extent. Uh, but uh, that's less than an ounce for every human being on the planet. It's really not an awful lot. And most of it's concentrated. So, uh, yeah. Well, one of the I things that I really like to think other about... Commodity, other commodities are also pretty cheap, although they've come up a lot in the last few years. But other commodities are pretty cheap, I think. As we speak, natural gas, very interesting. Uh, I'm most bullish on natural gas. I have some questions oh, about some other commodities, actually. The one thing I just to kind of wrap up our conversation about gold is I know you're very much a history buff. Um, I've 
I am as well. I really like a lot of the Roman history. I like the idea that there are gold Roman coins that existed 2000 years ago and are still here today. It really speaks to the longevity of gold. And it would just be, if, if, if you are right and we were to return to some type of a, a currency backed by gold, I think that that would solve so many problems in the world. Um, I think that's probably one of the most hopeful things I've ever heard you say, Doug. <laughs> well, you know, when I was a kid, a lot of other kids collected coins because the coins had real value. I mean, copper pennies were made out of copper. Most people... Most Americans are unaware of the fact that uh, it's no longer a copper penny. It's a zinc penny with a copper wash, even though the zinc in the penny is, is, is worth more than the penny itself. Uh, you know, up until 1966, uh, dimes, quarters, and half dollars were made out of silver. Well, now they just kind of look like silver, but I don't think kids collect coins anymore. Because they're not coins, technically speaking. They're tokens. They're slugs. True. When they're made out of, when they have value in themselves, they're coins. Now they're tokens or slugs, and you know that's a bad thing, because uh, when a kid saves coins, he thinks he's saving something of value. But I think kids understand that the slugs they're saving now, if they save these little coins. Of course, coins are going out of existence anyway. Forget about that. Or tokens are. Nobody even nobody even uses them in parking meters anymore. But uh, it, it corrupts the society because it makes it harder for a kid to think of amassing capital for himself by saving coins. Subtle, but I think important. Well, I think that there's been a corruption of education on many different fronts for generations. I dropped out of school when I was 12 years old. I hated public education on all fronts and I homeschool my kids and I want them nothing to do with these types of things because this perversion that we see in education all around us um, is unbelievable. And to try to teach mathematics, I can tell you teaching a little girl about mathematics is a lot easier if it has real life applications opposed to just theoretical things. And if I can pull out money and show her, um, you know, there's something to be said for that, but it's, it's kind of funny. And, and I've told this story several times on the podcast, but I'll, I'll make it really quick here. When we will use money, a, a American dollar bill or a Canadian dollar bill, and we'll try to teach her these types of things, what's the first thing you do afterwards? You go and wash your hands after you've touched coins and bills and stuff like that. You go and wash your hands afterwards. When I teach her about precious metals, gold and silver and things like that, the first thing we do before we touch it is wash our hands. You know, the value <laughs> is in, you know, I, I'm trying to teach her the respect and the understanding, you know, this is real money. This is, this is precious metals. These are, uh, has intrinsic value and has to humans for, you know, thousands of years, legitimately thousands of years. And, um, and the other one is this dirty fiat and it just doesn't have the same appeal. It doesn't have the same feeling to it. So I'm not a, um, I'm not a mystical type of person in any stretch of the imagination, but I do think that there is something slightly magical about precious metals, about gold. Yep. Yep. I have, I, I agree with that. And of course it's even better than you think because silver is a well-known bacteriophage. You actually kill, kill bacteria and same with copper actually. Uh, mm -hmm. So for what it's yeah. worth. Well, I won't get into it right now, but we actually have copper. We have these really expensive sheets that go over the bed that have are lined with copper because it kills any of the the bacteria and stuff like that. They cost hundreds of dollars. I'm all into um, uh, health things as well. So it's interesting when you look at the different types of metals and what they were used for. Copper piping and why is it used for these things? Because there are real values to these to these types of metals, and antibacterial is one of them. Let's change gear a little bit and talk about other types of commodities that you are bullish on. Um, Ultra bullish on uranium. Okay. That's a good place nuclear, to start. Nuclear power is by far the safest, the cheapest, and the cleanest form of mass power generation. Um, 
And I think that uh, you're going to find lots and lots of nuclear power plants, especially the new small ones, not the big giant ones that cost billions, but small self-contained ones that can be buried. Have you seen the ones that they can be buried? They put them underground and you come back in like 50 years and it's just... It's still generating power. Yep. <clears throat> uh, and, and there are... There are actually a couple of dozens of different technologies that are being worked on right now. So that's going to happen. Uh, that speaks very well for the future of uh, uranium. Um, and of course, you can't really buy, well, you can buy uranium directly through ETFs. But <clears throat> I like uh, uranium mining companies, uh, which had a bubble 20 some years ago, and they're going to have another bubble. So that's one. Um, I think that uh, the solar and wind mania, that's a different kind of bubble. I mean, <laughs> those are fine for remote applications, special applications. You know, there's a place for that kind of thing, any technology. But on the, the way they're trying to uh, run an industrial civilization on wind and solar, it's completely and totally insane and uneconomic, and it's going to wind up in a in a financial and economic catastrophe if they keep building these things, especially in places like Germany, for God's sake, where they're trying to do. So uh, not bullish on that stuff. Um, well, OK, let me interrupt you, because I I know that nuclear is the best option. You know that nuclear is the best option. It's scientifically proven. We have a thousand and one resources. We can discuss that all day. But it doesn't seem like these green agenda people, they actually want what's best they they want to destroy the planet like i mean it is complete hypocritical it makes absolutely no sense it's this double speak that is everywhere they say they're trying to save the planet and what do they do it's lithium mining and and all of these um ev metals and things like that strip mining everything and then we have a viable option which is clean with modern technology and not a huge impact and actually produces massive amounts of energy. I'm not talking about like a little tiny trickle of energy where we're depending on the sun. And if it rains, then you're screwed. Like, I mean, massive amounts of power, but they're shutting down nuclear power plants all through Europe and decommissioning and the technology and the research has not been done in the U S you have only places like China and Korea where actually research is being done on these types of things and they're leading the way on it. So do you really think, like I, I own the, the full transparency. I own uranium mining stocks. I have, I've been following this very closely, but sometimes I look at this and go, they're so against it. Like, are they going to finally wake up and realize that this is a good option or are they just going to cling to it with their last dying breath? I think the people, the wokesters that control the Western world today, they control the governments. Uh, actual Jacobins are in control in Washington at this point. The wokesters control the governments. They control the media. They control academia, where they're able to insinuate their ideas into the next generation. You know, you hear something from a person in authority, you tend to believe it. He's a professor. Um, these are horrible, anti-human people. I absolutely despise them. But how do we get rid of them? It, it, it's a real problem. Um, <laughs> well, they're looking for a great upset. I mean, these people that gather in Davos at the World Economic Forum and consider themselves the elite, you know, they've stated numerous times that there are too many people on the planet and the ideal number of people would be less than a billion uh, with themselves on top, of course. So what's going to happen? What kind of an upset is this great reset uh, going to be? Uh, it, it could be really scary. Uh, this is not going to be a mellow decade that we're looking at now. It's going to be, look, even World War III, which we're about due for this type of thing. The human chimpanzee likes to fight. And the world has become very unstable, I'm afraid, in many, many ways. And I'm, it's, it's, it's not even nuke, global thermonuclear war that scares me. And it scares me a lot. Maybe they'll start out with a cyber war 
because the entire world runs on computers, everything. The utilities run on computers, the trains, the aircraft, everything. Well, what we're doing now is only possible through computers. So a cyber war, uh, taking out satellites and computers, that could be really catastrophic, really catastrophic. But even worse than that would be a bio war because it's possible to develop bacteria and viruses, perhaps that are racial specific because there are differences between people from different parts of the world and attack the other guy, keep my guys safe. I mean, this is scary. Well, and of course, you get into artificial intelligence combined with robotics, and you wind up with the Terminator. And science fiction has long been a much better predictor of the future than any goofy think tank has been. So we'll, I'm sure we're going to see Terminators. It, 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 as crazy as that may sound to say, well, we will. Uh, AI and biological style robots, yeah, it's going to happen. So this is going to be really interesting to spectate. And I'm ha I'm glad I have a an estancia uh, in South America where I can watch this unfold as free entertainment on my widescreen instead of out my front window here in yep. North America. I'll be down there with you. We'll smoke cigars and we'll drink some um, some rum or some uh, some rye or something like that and watch the world burn because. I mean, I just don't understand a lot of people who are still sitting in New York or Los Angeles or Toronto or something like that and and just pretending that nothing's happening. I mean, I'm not a, a you know, have a bunker and, and tin cans to the ceiling by any means, but I do think that we all have to take a bit of personal responsibility on these things and move our families out of harm's way and just get out of the firing lines because this is coming. It's just prudent to do that today. That's, uh, this is one of those times in history that, you know, it's time to, you know, it's, yeah, right. Yeah, to consolidate for sure. I hope we're wrong. I I, I mean, 100%, I really, 100%. I like, and I like, listen, I like good times, uh, even if they're artificial, more than I like very real bad times. So. Yeah, and it's uh, to kind of, Harken back to our conversation about the investing side of things. It's it does make me second guess sometimes because I can look at the economics, I can look at the dependency in the world, I can understand where things need to go, but at the same time, there are a group of bad actors who are coming after um, things, and and I I really truly in my heart of hearts believe that they are trying to destroy society. There is there's no question in my mind, and I'm once again not a doomsday person but they're actively trying to destroy society. So I'm just not sure. Like it's the same type of thing when I think about agricultural plays, when I look over the last three years and I look at food shortages and all of these things, and it's like, well, maybe that's a great investment opportunity. But then when you start learning about what they've been doing in calling um, flocks of birds and giving fish PCR tests, they don't even have lungs for God's sakes, and they want to destroy all these animals, food sources, because of nothing. And, you know, this, I used to think it was ignorance and stupidity. I no longer think it's ignorance and stupidity. I think it's purposeful. Yeah. Evil is a, is a real thing. And I'm afraid that the word evil has been discredited in many people's minds because it's a word that's bandied around by uh, Bible Belt preachers calling everything evil and so forth. But it really does exist. Uh, people, people like Mao and Stalin, and Lenin, and Hitler, and Pol Pot, and there are many others, they actually hated humanity in general, and really did want to wipe out other people. I mean, that's manifestly obvious. And those are the kind of people, a kinder and gentler version of them, if you would, that control all the world's governments today, as well as other major institutions, including NGOs. There are thousands of NGOs in the world. They become very pro profitable, uh, very, very numerous. And when rich people die, they've been so um, brainwashed with propaganda 
they give money to these good sounding, benevolent sounding NGOs that are run by the same type of psychological criminals that run governments and academia. So from absolutely every angle uh, where, where Western civilization and its values are being attacked. Scary, but true. Scary, but true. With your investment thesis going forwards in 2024, how are you looking things? Are you really just buying physical metals? Are you still buying the mining stocks? Are you looking at other types of commodities? What's uh, What are you doing with your own portfolio? Well, in addition to the things we've mentioned, I'm big on natural gas stocks, uh, many of which yield close to 10% in current dividends. And I have a lot of upside because natural gas is in North America is close to all time lows in real terms. Uh, very big on uranium mining companies. They're an excellent speculation. But the big one actually is gold mining stocks. Because right now, uh, gold mining stocks are as cheap as they've ever been uh, in history. Uh, let's say gold is 1900, let's say it's 2000. The all in sustaining cost, which is not just the cash cost, but all things, including the cost of planting flowers on the mine site after, after the ore deposits mined out. Uh, all in sustaining cost, the average for the industry, is something like uh, $1,200 an ounce, $1,300 an ounce, something like that. Uh, so that Gold mining companies are coining money today, and they're as cheap as they've ever been in history. And with the insanity of central banks, gold could be explosive. There could be a panic into gold. And these mining companies are not, they're not small caps. They're not even micro caps. They're not even nano caps. They're pico caps. They're so teeny weeny. So the answer to the question is, I own a lot of them. They're like lottery tickets in some ways, because you don't know who's going to get lucky and get into production. Mining is a terrible business today, incidentally. I mean, you know, they, there used to be this expression, hey, it's like finding a gold mine. No, that's when your troubles start, finding a gold mine. It'll take you at least 10 years to put it into production. And then everybody tries to extract, a, the natives will try to extract money. The NGOs will try to, it, it's a horrible business. But because these stocks are so volatile and they're so cheap, I think we could easily get a 10 to one run in, in that. So I'm heavy in gold mining stocks. And what else? Well, there are other things like shipping. For the first time ever, uh, I've uh, bought a shipping ETF because shipping companies like this one ETF that I bought uh, is, uh, is 20 shipping companies from around the world. Uh, bulk carriers, uh, 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 oil carriers, uh, container carry, all these things, all these shipping companies. The average price earnings ratio of these things is in between two and five to one, really cheap. But more interesting is that they're down about 90% plus from the peak. So anything that's down 90% has a huge dividend yield like that and is necessary. Shipping is necessary. Yep. So I'm buying that too. And the CTF I just bought has, I hate ETFs as a general rule. And so I won't go into all that. Has a 15% current dividend yield. Wow. I'm interested. <laughs> so that's another thing that I'm doing. Um, I don't know. That that's it. I'm pretty selective. I don't want any part of the stock market in general. Yep. Absolutely zero part of the bond market. You're not buying Facebook or Tesla or uh Google or any of these ones? <laughs> if I was bold enough, I would I would short all of them, as well as <laughs> Pfizer and Moderna, which no uh, doubt. hopefully will go to zero. Yeah. Uh, which is a pity because pharma companies have actually developed drugs that do save people's lives when there's a disease. But yeah, I hope those two go to zero. Um, yeah, there's not many places you can hide. And of course, gold and silver, physical coins, mm -hmm. some where you live and some in a different political jurisdiction because mm -hmm. you're 
political risks are bigger than your financial risks today. And the financial risks are huge. Well, my last question for you today, as to kind of go back to the start of our conversation with World War III, you know, if we're looking at North America, Europe, um, Southeast Asia, these places, um, Latin America, where do you think is actually, if we had to pick one, is going to be the most safe to actually build your life? Um, what region of the world do you think that uh, that people should be looking at? South America is very interesting. Uh, almost all of the leaders in South America are socialists, ranging from mild to goofy to actually crazy. Uh, Uruguay at the moment is the mellowest of uh, the Latin American countries. Um, Panama is going to remain okay as a financial center, I think. But I like that. Uh, I always recommend that young people uh, look at Africa for a lot of reasons that I've explained in my writings, uh, including in, in, in my first novel, Speculator, which Apropos of our conversation, anybody that's still listening to us, uh, go on Amazon, get a copy of Speculator. It's a series of seven things that uh, is uh, hopefully reforming the uh, bad reputations of, of six unjustly besmirched occupations. Uh, second novel we did is Drug Lord. Third is Assassin. Not really an occupation. It shows you can be a good guy and be an assassin. <laughs> So anyway, but uh, by speculator, uh, and it kind of takes the conversation we're having in 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 a novelistic form. Uh, Africa is interesting for a young guy that is looking to make money on an adventure basis. Uh, but which part of the world is going to do best, other than Latin America, which I have high hopes for, is um, East Asia. Uh, I hope. You know, China and Taiwan, Japan, uh, Korea, uh, they, they're not infected with the woke virus, at least. We can say that. Whatever problems they have. But there's some, some pretty hawkish stuff going on over in that part of the world right now. And it's going to be really divided up between a China and a U.S. front. Asia is one yeah. of my favorite places to spend time, but it's just heartbreaking to watch this unfold. And just like Japan doubling their military budget and um, Philippines going all in with the states and then just oh. the South China Sea, I'm just scared oh, about. It, it, yeah, this, it, it, it really is. It really is scary. I mean, I, I'm afraid that humans are really just highly evolved chimpanzees at this point. And every once in a while, they, they go crazy. And we may be headed towards one of those times. Brilliant. Doug, I think that's where we will end our conversation today. Thank you very much for coming on the program. I really appreciate your insights as always. And uh, definitely anybody who's listening, make sure you check out Speculator and the book of the um, Doug's books. I've read all of them. I even got to be a beta reader for your third book and actually helped to um, give some insights when it was still in the draft phase with uh, back and forth with John. So a uh, big well, fan of fourth, your work. The upcoming fourth book, uh called Terrorist, uh, uh, is where we're really going to get into some hot and heavy stuff. Also, I'm working on another book talking about education and so forth, it's called The Renaissance Man, which basically is a guidebook to what a young person should do instead of going to college, kind of laying out exactly what you should do for that four years, as well as years before and years after, in terms of bettering yourself in education. So... Well, very happy to contribute or to be a, a sounding board on any of those things because I am firmly in the plant of uh, of not going to university. And as I said before, uh, traditional education was not my path. Uh, traveling and exploring the world and and um, talking to smart people like you has uh, served me much, much better. So, Doug, thank well, you very much, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate it.